Jeg har her en indbydelse til pressen til at møde kronprinsen og Mary Donaldson ved et pressemøde på Fredensborg Slot den 8. oktober kl. 15.30. Nu er den her den officielle meddelelse om, at kronprins Frederik og Mary Elizabeth Donaldson skal giftes. Det har hoffet netop oplyst. Well, I'm just about to uh, travel off to Australia, and um, I'm very excited, obviously. It's been nearly a year since I was last there, so I look forward so much to seeing my family and my friends, and Tasmania and Sydney and Melbourne and everything about Australia. Um, but first, we have to take part in this long journey on a uh, airplane which is nearly 24 hours so all up a trip of about 28 hours I was born in Tasmania Australia in the capital of Tasmania Hobart in 1972 I'm the youngest of four I have two elder sisters and an older brother <laughs> My middle sister, Patricia, who's about to be married tomorrow, to <laughs> the lovely Scott. <laughs> and this is my brother, John, who looked after me so much when I was a kid and always included me in everything he did. Everything. Didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then we have Hi. Leanne, who Hi. is my brother's wonderful wife. I'm an aunt eight times, so we have really turned into quite a big family. I have wonderful nieces and nephews. And this is my father. And this is the lovely Susan, who's my father's great love. Hi. <laughs> My two elder sisters still live in Hobart. My brother has recently moved from Western Australia to the very northern part of Eastern Australia. My father also lives in Tasmania, but for only part of the year. He's in South Korea as well, and in Oxford. And for some time next year, he'll be working at the University of Aarhus. This is Frederick, who you probably know. <laughs> And, yes. and he'll be a wonderful addition to our family as well. And everyone already 
thinks a lot about him yeah, and yeah. very welcome and happy to be part of our family. We'll drink to that. Mm. Cheers. 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 Yeah. Cheers. And that's it. Stars, maybe. My father was quite strict. <laughs> I think he was the strictest with me. By the time he got to Mary, he was sort of easing off a little bit. So she got away with quite a lot of uh, things that I probably didn't get away with. As the fourth one, I got away with a lot more, which my sister, I'm sure, will gladly confirm. <laughs> or my sisters will gladly confirm, I should say. Well, we've come from a very close family um, to loving um, parents, mum and dad. Very, very close, and we did so much together as children. Um, we shared rooms. So, yeah, we're a very close family. But I always remember my sister having to come home and tell my parents that she was home, and I'm sure all her other friends were only just starting the party. I was more of a disciplinarian than necessary. I, I, I think that everybody most of my friends thought I was very strict with the children. Uh, I probably was. I tried to uh, make sure that their homework was done, that I tried to make sure that they uh, knew that, uh, that a secure life was one that they ought to be interested in. Some pictures from my parents' wedding, which these are just copies, so they're not the originals. It's beautiful. <laughs> they were so young when they got married. Yeah. Oh, here's another picture of just all of us with mum. My wife was a, a personal assistant to the vice chancellor at the university when she retired, and she worked in many departments at the university. She was pretty well known. She was perhaps uh, one of those people who, who helped to establish some of the new departments as the personal assistant secretarial type work, etc. And uh, when she retired, uh, she, she had reached perhaps uh, the top of the positions that she could have occupied as a personal assistant to the vice chancellor. Uh, and it's unfortunately just after she retired is when we decided to uh, have an operation on her heart and it didn't work out as, as well as we'd hoped. And here's a photo of my mum which I really love. It's just, um, I mean it was just taken, yeah, nothing special, but she just has a very happy look on her face, a very contented look on her face, I think. She's with one of her cats which she so loved. My mother used to take us to the uh, old Olympic pool, which is a big diving pool, so the water's very blue and very deep, and our mother used to take us out to swim breaststroke, and Mary and I would hang off each shoulder, and that was just a great feeling. I think that's, for both of us, we both love the water, and that was one of the, the introductions as very young kids to be out in this you know, quite deep water, but feeling so safe on, on our mother's back. You know, it was, that was fantastic. The loss of my mother was a complete shock. It um, was nothing that anyone could prepare for, although I don't think anyone can prepare for a death, whether it's after a long illness or it's from an accident. Um, and it certainly changes your perspective on life in many ways and in the beginning you cannot find any reason or any fairness in what has happened. You, your experience of emotions is incredible. You experience every type of emotion in an extreme way from anger to guilt, it, it's, it's quite, a, quite a turbulent time. Oh, here's a beautiful picture of my mother. She was going to my aunt's wedding. Yeah, she looks beautiful. Mum and Dad?
And I also remember the the first time I got involved in horses. My mother had never been around horses, and she was quite scared of them. But she worked so hard at being comfortable around them because she knew how much I loved them, and she would come with me, and and we'd go to horse events, and she would come with me, and and things. So she she really got involved in in her children as well with what her children were doing um, and I'm sure everyone would say exactly the same thing about their mother but I don't think you could ask for <laughs> yeah a better mother I don't know why it's so hard to tell when a camera's facing you <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do I look like I've been crying now? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Going back to Tasmania provides an opportunity to see parts of Tasmania that I still have to discover. And with Frederick there, it's so nice to show him the places that I've always held close to my heart. Men de uh, afløser pilot uh, undervisning i går, for de blæste for meget. <laughs> så vi er heldige i dag. We actually did a flying trip up the east coast with my uncle. Uh, and that was so brilliant. It was a wonderful day. To, to see the views from the plane, um, to fly into Wineglass Bay across the hazards and to, just to see the shape of the bay and the colors of the bay is incredibly beautiful. Um, but it also had another special moment because my, um, it was a place also that my grandmother loved and, and her ashes were spread from my uncle's plane um, across Wineglass Bay as well. So it was also a, a very special moment to be, to be up there with her and, and to look at the area where she likes to come and visit still. It's a photo of me and my grandmother. Actually, this was the last visit. This is the last time I saw her. My grandmother was also Mary Elizabeth Donaldson, so I was her namesake. And I admire her so much. For in her older age, she stayed such an independent person. She never wanted for anything, but she had such a simple life. But up until she became suddenly very ill, she was at adult education schools. She was at Scottish dancing. Even if she couldn't dance, she was watching. She was taking writing lessons. She was, she was always doing something and I admire her a lot for that, and we had quite a special 
relationship. Although I'm sure every one of her grandchildren would say that because she had that ability to make you feel special. But we used to write letters to each other and we always communicate, we'd speak on the phone, but we always communicated by letter. And I would send her photos of what I was doing when I was living in Melbourne or Sydney or traveling the world or wherever I may have been in the world. We would, I would write letters to her and she loved letters and she had a beautiful hand as well. So to get letters from her was, was so wonderful. Actually, the last two trips we've been to Tasmania, we've taken the trip up to the East Coast, to Coles Bay, and to walk into Wineglass Bay. It doesn't matter how many times you've done it, the beauty of the place just captures your heart each time. There's so much still to see in Tasmania, and I'm sure that we will continue to go back there, and every time we go back, we'll take in a new and wonderful experience there. My brother and I followed each other quite closely through schooling. He's only 18 months older than me. So we were together at uh, Sandy Bay Infants, um, and then we moved at the same time to Waimea Heights after that. Um, and then, of course, I was at Waimea Heights and another year after he moved on to Taruna High School. But all of us went to Waimea Heights, Taruna High School, then on to Hobart College. Jeg vil her fra grade 7 til grade 10. Vi siger grade. 7. klasse. 7. klasse til 10. klasse. Og så jeg var færdig her, da jeg var næsten 16. Taruna High School was four years of when you really start to grow up, I think. Yeah. Og så dagen var Engels og musik i Bytning C. One event that is very clear in my mind is uh, a time that perhaps was a little bit embarrassing for myself, but also a time where I got a lot of support from my fellow students. And we were in advanced science. Science. Det er fysik, kemi. Fysik, kemi og så. I was sitting next to one of my friends and. I was a bit of a chatterbox at school and didn't mind a bit of laughter. And um, my friend was busy poking me and talking at me. And um, the teacher at that time told me to be quiet. Uh, and that happened probably another time. And then <laughs> quite um, surprisingly, he came storming up to me and with a closed fist, hit me on the top of my head, which actually didn't really hurt, but it was just the shock and the embarrassment of it. And I think everyone in the room was quite shocked and perhaps himself a little bit as well. But uh, the next time we had advanced, uh, advanced science, he, um, he walked into a room full of students wearing crash helmets. Um, but I mean, at that time of schooling, it's a very active time. You're into everything. You you want to play every sport. You want to do every class you can. You want to do music. You want to do drama. You want to do, well, you have to do math. You have to do science, etc. But it's um, it's a really fun time in your life. What do you think? Well, it looks like in here. Oh no, it looks like my boarding school in France. Does it? I think at high school, or at that time of my life, my hobbies focused around sport. I played everything 
I had time to fit into my program. Um, so after school was spent training for basketball, training for hockey, training for tennis, training for lacrosse. <laughs> it's, um, it was also a great time of my life because I love physical activity, I love competition, I love I love sports. So my hobbies during that time of my life was primarily sport. A little bit later came horses. Um, and that continues to be one of my biggest hobbies, um, to, to spend time and be around horses. Koshe! Smokey! Aye, hello! Hello! How are you? Smokey Hest. No. Oh, hi, beautiful. I suppose in a way it's, it's like a form of meditation. Um, but to, to go up and to, to call out the horse's name and for him to call back to me and just to see the way he looks expectantly at you, you know, even though he's looking for carrots or a piece of sugar, he, he, he greets you in his way. <laughs> and a little nest today. Did I so much? Oh, the flat. The flat. The sweat that set her up on was the betuer. Man has a forhold to hesten, som er helt specielt. Og jeg er sikker på, at folk som har sådan et forhold forstår, hvad jeg mener. Når jeg kommer op til hesten tænker jeg kun på, hvad jeg laver der. Rigtig. Albuerne ind. Ja. Rigtig. Rigtig. Ja. Rigtig. Rigtig. Fint. Ind tilbage. Tilbage og sidde. Tilbage og sidde. Når man redder, har man en fysisk forbindelse med hesten. Man prøver at være et. Og jeg bliver så glad og tilfreds, når vi springer højt. Og jeg kan føle, at hesten bevæger sig flot. Og vi redder ud i skoven og oplever naturen. På hesten føler man sig som en del af naturen. Then uh, through, uh, we have matriculation college, which is two years after high school. My first year of um, matric, I spent also in the area of science and maths. But in my second year, I actually shifted to more business side. So I did economics and legal studies and, and so forth, accounting, etc. cetera. Um, I then went to university. I was accepted into the economics or commerce department, I should say. Um, so I started my first year in commerce and took introduction to law as, as an additional subject. After the first year, um, I was accepted into law school. So I spent five years at the University of Tasmania and graduated with a Bachelor of Commerce and Law. I moved to Melbourne just after I finished university and uh, took up a graduate position with uh, one of the world's largest advertising agencies, DDB Needham. 
which was in this building here. Mary uh, joined us as a graduate trainee, and what that meant was that uh, she was to work in a number of different areas to try and learn the basics of marketing communication. At my time at DDB, I also spent some time um, with additional courses to learn a little bit more about the industry. I remember sometimes I got frustrated with Mary because she was impatient, as we all are when we're in our 20s and starting our career. And she wanted to move ahead quicker than I thought she should. She wanted to move into different areas quicker than she was ready for. Um, but if that's a weakness, then I think that's acceptable. Uh, in many ways, it's a strength, perhaps. I'd spent 18 months working at DDB about, and then I was offered an, a fantastic job with another company. And I had the decision to stay with DDB or to, to move to Mojo Partners. Mojo Partners is quite a different agency to DDB Needham. Um, it has a different, um, it's a different environment. It has a very, it was a very youthful, creative and dynamic environment. So I started off working over this side of the city and then right in the city a little bit later. Where I am now is an area called Albert Park. And as I lived around this area, I was here quite a lot because it's a great place for walking, running. Uh, to my left is also Albert Park Golf Course, uh, where I used to play a little bit of golf or where I first started my golf. Melbourne's a fantastic city and it's actually very beautiful in its own right. I mean, if you look at Sydney and Melbourne, they're, they're very different. But the beauty of Melbourne, as you can see, is, is also quite amazing. I saw myself as, as one day being the managing director of an international company. Um, after I had been there um, for close to two years, um, I lost my mother. And um, <clears throat> that, that changed things quite a lot for me. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I. Um, I continued to work, of course. I went back to work quite quickly after my mother passed away. And um, um, But things in my head had changed a bit. I, I had a sense of that now is the most important time and that it was no longer appropriate for me to put off things that I'd always dreamt of doing and and follow one ambition solely. So after six months after my mother's death, I, um, I resigned from my work and I took off and traveled the world for 10 months. <laughs> And not until I was on that plane with my backpack in the hole, sitting by myself on the plane, did I think, what have I done? <laughs> Where am I going? And um, so I, I'd really taken myself out of any sense of um, stability just to, just to wander a bit. When she got to Edinburgh, where my family comes from, uh, and of course she contacted many of her relatives there and uh, had a great time with her relatives in that time, at that time. So she did in fact get a job in the area that she was working, with, working at in Melbourne before she uh, came back to Australia. So in fact it was a working holiday rather than just a holiday. But when I settled in Scotland, had my job, was spending you know, doing the, the na normal daily routines, I suddenly realized I couldn't be so far away from my family. It was, it was <clears throat> too early for me to, 
to be so far away. So um, I decided that I would continue my little journey after I finished my contract and, and continue home in, as a, as a traveller. When I came back from my travels, I was offered a fantastic job in Sydney. And Sydney provided me with an opportunity to, to extend my travel because I hadn't lived here before. And Sydney is such a beautiful and exciting town. And it was just adding to the adventures that I'd had for the last 10 months, but being closer to my family um, and, and where I'm from. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Amber. Mm -hmm. Lovely What's to see you. Good, good question. Yeah, I know. We're just in the same park. Amazing. It's really bizarre. Yeah, it's and nice it's to see you. Yeah. We actually worked together at a marketing company in Melbourne uh, in the early 90s. Um, and then we moved up to Sydney at the same time. And I think that's probably when we became um, very close because Sydney's a, a difficult place to live at times, even though it's beautiful. So we sort of looked after each other and um, kind of went through a lot of the same sort of evolving experiences together, which was nice. It's nice to have each other. What I love about Mary the most is I think she's probably one of the most honest and natural people that I've ever met. I think, um, you know, even given the situation that she's in now and, and, and obviously a very happy situation for her, I think no matter what she did in life, she would always be Mary. She would never, ever, ever change. And I think that's really admirable for someone because I think, you know, sometimes being in different situations in life, it is easy to lose sight of who you are and, and that's just natural but I don't think Mary will ever do that and I think um, she'll be the same Mary in 10 years time which I think is really nice. Here is the office building that I worked for, Young and Rubicum and there's their sign there, Frederick. Excuse me but what sort of driving is that? <laughs> so we can say that was the building. <laughs> but Young and Rubicum was a fantastic place to work and really really great people. It was a lot of fun as well. It was a very young agency yeah. uh, and very, very creatively focused. So everything was around finding the, the best idea to communicate the message we had to. So the building that I used to work in is right here. And we were on the top two floors of this building. We were, we were a part of a global advertising agency and we were asked to run some commercials uh, that were produced in Europe. And Mary didn't think they were right for Australia. So she fought and fought and fought, and it was quite a difficult fight. And she fought um, quite hard with the, uh, our colleagues uh, overseas. And eventually we were able to produce the commercial that we wanted to produce, and very much because of Mary and, and the strength that she brought to that. Uh, maybe left. So this area we're going into now is Paddington, which is fantastic. It's so pretty. It's such a pretty area. All these wonderful old terrace houses, little gardens, and they look very small, but they extend back quite a way. I met a friend's place, well actually three friends who live together in a house in Paddington which is a fantastic house and it's the first time I've seen it, so I'm very impressed um, and we're here just with a group of friends, of great friends of mine in Sydney and just having a wonderful time and enjoying ourselves. <laughs> Oh, we went to university together, and um, then I met 
met up with her after university when I came back here to Sydney and she moved up to Sydney and I had her to stay in my house for a little while. What am I doing here? Well, I'm celebrating, well, no, not celebrating, commiserating Mary and Fredericks last night in Sydney. So we're having a little bit of a barbecue with all her old friends. <laughs> And don't ask her because she was just lying. She's not my party. Oh, I'm pretty good. I met Frederick um, during the Sydney Olympics, um, and at that time I was working for an agency called Love. One of the greatest things about Sydney for me is the beaches, and it became one of our favourite things together. We used to love to go down to the beach early in the morning and take a swim and then go up to the cafes and find a cafe to have breakfast in um, or vice versa, go down and have breakfast and then go for a swim. But from all the cafes along in that area you can see the water and and hear the sounds of the waves and it's just such an idyllic place to to sit and talk and and start the day. It was a wonderful meeting of of two people, um, but in terms of how that impacted my everyday life, it, it couldn't. I mean, it was a it was a beginning. It wasn't a my life changed overnight. Um, I've always been quite a rational thinker and I mean he was from a completely other world not only geographically but in his upbringing. Um, we'd spent very little time together so it would be irrational of me to to change the way I go about focusing on my life. When Frederick went back to Denmark, I was not sure if I'd ever see him again. We'd only spent such a short period together and he lives on the other side of the world, so it wasn't a certainty that we would meet again. Um, of course I was saddened when he left um, and felt that it was such a shame that he wasn't an Australian, you know, because I'd met someone that sparked an interest um, and so I felt a little bit sad that he wasn't an Australian <laughs> but it wasn't there was no certainty in it um, so we continued our lives as as two independent people but there was this continuous connection of words that we had through the telephone through email so in a way we got to know each other in a in a slightly old-fashioned way. We, um, we got to know each other through words and we really built up a strong friendship and understanding of each other through words. Um, we would send each other music uh, from our parts of the world, our favorite lollies. We would send each other pictures of things that had happened. Uh, we would also write to each other. It wasn't just email and telephone. We, we really grew to know each other and grew our friendship through words. I have to buy Susan some um, flowers. Oh. Oh, he's fantastic with my family. It's, it, it's so nice to see how relaxed he is around them. My nieces and nephews love him. Um, my family think he's he is a wonderful person, uh, which he is. Um, we have a great time together. Um, he, it's great to see how it all fits together. We've um, found Frederick to be a person who's just like any other future son-in-law. He, he is such a relaxed individual. He just becomes part of the family when, when he's around us. Um, he cooks his own breakfast the other morning there, so, and uh, in fact, yesterday morning he ended up cooking Susan's breakfast, so uh, we're very pleased to have someone who, who helps us out. Small.
it. Uh, you might say there is for, for New South Wales people. <laughs> he and Mary, of course, uh, are run around with the grandchildren, and they're very happy to have the grandchildren uh, come to them, and uh, they're always the grandchildren's arms are out for who gets the first hug whenever Frederick and Mary come in. Well, Frederick loves children. He's he has a wonderful way with children. He's a very young-hearted person. He he will get down on his knees and play and run and jump and scream and act for them. Um, and children are very wise. They can see when a person is a good person. Having met, met Frederick in the last few days and got to know him um, and seen Mary with him, you, can, you just can tell they're in love and, and it's just fantastic. It feel, makes me feel great that my little sister has found someone so wonderful and uh, the fact that he's Crown Prince of Denmark is just, it's, <laughs> it's incredible too. <laughs> The nature in Australia is some of the world's oldest nature and one feels very lucky to grow up in such a, a clean and pristine environment. The city of Hobart itself, I mean, it is a small city. The total population of Tasmania is only 472,000 people. So it is a small island state, but I think over the last you know, 20 years or so, Tasmania is really coming into its own. People are recognizing the beauty of, of Tasmania and all that it has to offer. Let's compare. <laughs> Sammenligner. The Sammenligner, uh, Tasmanians climate till uh, Bordeaux. So um, we have mal sol or ixomal rhyme. Um, uh, we also have a little frost there on winter. So, it's um, really good to Rudvin, Pinot Noir, the Lyse Rudvin, or sparkling champagne. I think Tasmania is, is really becoming known around the world for its premium produce. Its, its wine has won international awards, its cheeses, the salmon that it um, breeds, the, the oysters, there's, there's so many wonderful uh, producers from Tasmania that uh, are being more and more taken up by the world. Hey, you! I, excuse me, <laughs> just wait your turn. <laughs> Tasmania is a, an island of, of nature. It's a place where I think people go to, to appreciate the world in its natural state. It, it, it boasts so many uh, wonderful um, vista points or um, walking tracks or places where you can just be out in the elements and, and live and breathe nature. And I think that's why people love to go and visit there. It takes them away from, I suppose, for what many people is the reality of a very, very busy world. It could be like around now, that you can risk to get 35 degrees, if you're happy. Yeah, but last year, when we were here, it was so warm. It was 30 years old. 30 years old. 30 degrees. My first words from a dear friend who taught me how to count backwards from 10 
to yell God Nudo as I jumped from a chair. So that was my first, they were my first Danish words. Det er svært at sige, hvad det sværeste er. Det er mange svære ting, når det danske sprog. Udtalen er svært. Det tager lang tid at lære dansk, fordi danskere også taler rigtig godt engelsk. Talte de dansk, mens de var i Australien? Ikke så meget, som jeg skulle. He was from the Cruelty, but he's maybe he's singing alone now. Is this Tex Robert? Tex Perkins. Big Tex. We speak English. It's a little bit hard to change from English um, because that's how we know each other. We do speak a little bit of Danish together and when I should be practicing, you know, I switch to Danish. But we talk mainly, it's mainly on detail things that we speak Danish. But primarily it's English. Og hvis jeg snakker med nogen fra Danmark, taler jeg altså fuld i dansk. Ja, det er klart. <laughs> I have two fantastic teachers, and they alternate um, lessons. So I, I hear and speak from each other, but they obviously talk a lot together about what happened in the previous lesson and so forth. But we spend a lot of time uh, Obviously on pronunciation, because that is a very difficult part of the language. We spend a lot of time on learning uh, new and fast expressions. We also, it's, it's a bit multimedia like, we, we read the newspapers, we read historical books, we read about the royal family, we watch uh, things that are important in, in Denmark's history. For example, the TV series Matador. We listen to tapes. We go to exhibitions that are on around the city. Um, so it's a really dynamic way of learning as well. Dansk har en særlig rytme. Yes, I think it's taken a bit of time, but I also don't have anything to measure it against because I haven't learned another language. For me, Danish is the first language I've spoken other than my mother tongue. Um, and it's always something I've dreamt of, is speaking another language. I think there's no doubt that she has taken on uh, Danish ears. Uh, she does have a, a slight Danish touch in her voice and her accent. Uh, perhaps it's not obvious to people from Denmark, but it's certainly obvious to us that there is a, a slight accent there. I received a, a letter while I was in Korea from Frederick asking me for Mary's hand in marriage, and he that was followed up by a phone call and I, I was absolutely delighted that uh, he had taken the formal way of doing things. And of course, I had, I had no way was I, I going to stand in the way of their happiness. And uh, so, and of course, one doesn't these days anyway. But I, 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 I sent a letter back. Uh, I spent a lot of time trying to get the right paper because in Korea, it was very, it's very difficult to get the correct paper to write back on it. I got papers from a Buddhist monastery, uh, a piece of parchment paper, and uh, I wrote uh, my acceptance and hoped that uh, he was going to be a good, good uh, husband to my daughter. <laughs> when the engagement uh, of uh, Mary and Frederick was announced, it was very exciting. The, chil the children were most excited, like, my auntie is going to be a princess. And it was quite funny, um, my, one of our close family friends came up a couple of days later and actually said to me, do you know that your mum, your mum used to call Mary princess when she was a little girl? And I thought, well, most mums would call their little children princesses, but no mum would actually think that that would occur. So that was just, that was a lovely thought from her. I was just really happy that she'd uh, found someone that she loved enough to say yes to. <laughs> I was very excited, very excited, um, because we don't have any royals here, we, and it's always 
so far away, so it's hard for us to sort of understand, I mean, how huge it is. And it is huge that, that she is going to be a crown princess. So we're very excited about it, yeah. Just before walking into the press meeting, that was, to take that step in was really taking a, a big leap out of your comfort zone. to sit down and, and to wait until everyone grew silent. And the first words to come out of my mouth felt quite foreign. <laughs> Good day. I will go and say a few words before we begin. I am very glad for to be in Denmark. Today is a very spannende day. So I am sure that they can understand that I am a little small in the house. But the balcony scene was something quite different to that. It, it also was a huge moment to see the crowds gathering outside. It's hard to put words on how I felt coming out onto the balcony. It in one way was a bit like an out-of-body experience because these people were there to, to congratulate us. and to show their love for the royal family. But it was hard to see myself in that picture. To see the combination of Danish and Australian flags, you know, flying, flying energetically was just such a beautiful picture. And that feeling of warmth and acceptance and joy that people were feeling as we were feeling. A good marriage is a marriage that, that lasts forever. It's a marriage that continues to, to grow and develop as the individuals grow and develop. It's based on trust and respect and understanding. It's full of love and happiness. But a good marriage is one that, that, that grows and stretches and bends and, and takes the hurdles of life as it, as it comes. And that the, the two people involved in the marriage work to make the road as smooth as, and joyful as possible. I think a happy life is a life full of um, purpose, a life full of 
um, openness to new and challenging things because the only constant in life in, is change and without change you don't grow and to grow is is to to live so i think if you can can truly say that as a person you develop and you have a level of contentment and you can love that's what being happy is about There is a lot of things right now which I have to learn. There's a lot of um, new pressures I've never had in my life before. Yep. Folketingets formand, så vil fortælle dig om ikke det samme, men om næsten det samme set fra Folketingets side. Så du ligesom bliver dækket ind både fra hvordan regeringen ser på på tingene, hvordan Folketinget ser. Hard is probably not the. I think it's more a challenging work. Than, than hard work, but it's such a, a strong time of growth for me that it's an exciting time as well and that you have a very strong dedication to doing, doing what you can to prepare yourself in the best way possible. How my new role will develop and be defined is is yet to be defined. Um, obviously, historical elements, the time we live in today, what roles other members of the royal family have, uh, what I have, or where my passion lies, are all elements that will define my role. Um, of course, there's many things that I think of and am very excited to think about the opportunity of being able to work with. Um, and they're things that I've been passionate about all my life. Uh, and now, with the opportunity of this role, to be able to, to make a difference in these areas is extremely exciting. The role into which I'm going requires a lot of commitment, dedication and hard work. And I have no fantasies about that. But I know that you cannot call... Work is not hard work if you're passionate about it. And I know now the excitement I feel when I think about the opportunities I have to to be a worthy representative of Denmark is something I am passionate about. Well, Frederick has a wealth of experience and knowledge that is very important to me now. Um, he can really give me the support and advice to um, help me in my new role and he is a wonderful teacher. Mm -hmm.